Back during our first year here on YouTube, we covered a little old movie called Noroi, aka The Curse, which quite honestly remains one of our favorite found footage projects, if not horror films overall. This month, let's take a look at some other films from the director of Noroi, Koji Shiraishi. Shiraishi has had a pretty lengthy, varied career. Not varied in that he's gone through a ton of different genres over the years, but rather that he's explored numerous types of horror films. Though, admittedly, today we will be discussing another found footage horror movie. Early in his career, Koji Shiraishi served as an assistant director for directors Gakuryu Ishii and Shinobu Yaguchi, who we've covered in the past. In the early 2000s, Shiraishi gained success with his direct-to-DVD and TV movies, where he earned his reputation as an up-and-coming presence in Japanese horror. In the West, unfortunately, Shiraishi has remained relatively unrecognized as one of the louder voices in the J-horror movement of the 2000s. While lesser known, Noroi in particular has ensured that those who do come across Shiraishi's works regard him as one of the more important horror directors working today. Following these successes in cheap horror productions, Shiraishi began exploring other avenues of horror, perhaps most notably the found footage genre. Not long after the groundbreaking success of The Blair Witch Project and the international notoriety of both The Ring and The Grudge, stylistically, Shiraishi largely began to eschew the latter, to which most Japanese production houses were moving, and instead headed towards the former. Later, Shiraishi would explore torture porn and even comedy horror, which we'll be discussing in future videos. But consistent throughout the young director's post Noroi career was his insistence that he build upon this initial win by directing a series of further found footage projects. Each of these films naturally has its own strengths and weaknesses, which set each of them apart from Noroi, with some of them even getting a bit… Uh, odd, shall we say. In the four years between Noroi and Shiraishi's next found footage film, Occult, Shiraishi put to tape two direct-to-video movies, a television series, the aforementioned torture porn film, and perhaps his best-known movie Beyond Noroi, based on a popular urban legend about the slip-mouthed woman. You may have picked up on this, but Shiraishi is nothing if not prolific and diverse. Occult used the world-building techniques Shiraishi had learned from his numerous other films, most notably Noroi. It did away with any jokiness from his other films, instead giving whole hog on the serious aspects of its narrative, which is obvious just from the start of the story. A cult begins with a stabbing incident in 2005, which results in two deaths and one major injury. Similar to Noroi, the director here injects himself into the film's narrative. However, instead of the director being a made-up character inside of the film's universe, in Occult, Shiraishi himself becomes the character, further breaking the fourth wall. After the initial stabbing incident being played for us in its entirety, we join the director three years later, in 2008, as he begins exploring the topic in earnest. We encounter the survivors of the incident and the victims' families. Most notably, we speak with the man who suffered an injury yet survived the attack, Shohei Eno. Eno appears to be a schizophrenic man who claims to hear voices and see what he describes as miracles, though he doesn't really explain what these miracles entail, at least initially. The bulk of the film thus follows Eno throughout his troubles, as Shiraishi tries to make sense of the incident and Eno's worldview. Without spoiling anything concerning where the film's narrative goes, let's examine some topics that might help us further comprehend the film. As you likely are already expecting us to say, a cult is sort of a wild ride, and you ought to check it out for yourself. As such, we don't want to explore any of the twists and turns. Instead, we would rather delve into some of the various real-world connections that inform how a cult plays out. Perhaps these might count as spoilers in and of themselves, but we won't be telling you how these elements play into the film. Anyway, let's see what we can learn that might help us better appreciate a cult. First, let's look at automatic drawing and automatic writing, also known as psychography. Psychography has a relatively lengthy history, being used as far back as the 16th century. Two men living in the 1500s, John Dee and Edward Kelly, would at this time supposedly receive writings from angels who used their hands and writing instruments as media to communicate with humanity. The idea in this context is that holy or spiritual beings can use humans as conduits for communication. Others have suggested that psychography, like with other forms of divination, can be used to access the unconscious parts of one's own mind. 
This accounts for the history of automatic writing. Automatic drawing, on the other hand, seems to be a much more recent development, at only roughly 100 years old. Today, examples of automatic drawing are common with the practice having only increased in popularity as time has gone on. Similar to automatic writing, automatic drawing is used for both art and for spiritual channeling. Speaking of spiritual channeling, this practice has a lengthy tradition in Japan, as it does in many parts of the world with long traditions of spiritualism. Onmyoto, or the Way of Yin and Yang, a type of Japanese Taoist mysticism, which we've discussed previously, dealt primarily with geomancy and determining the auspicious nature of names and dates. At times, however, Onmyoto also dealt with spirit communication. Existing before and after the height of Onmyoto, there existed Shinto, Japan's indigenous animistic religion. In terms of spiritual communication, Shinto channelers have existed for centuries. We've discussed this previously with the documentary Itako Visions. Itako are the primary group of Shinto channelers, as we explained there. Itako are often elderly, mostly blind women, who perform communications with and the channelings of spirits. Though they're not as popular or common nowadays, Itako are still around. Even beyond the realms of Onmyoto and Shinto, the channeler Rei Chandra, who works largely in Japan today, explains that he uses symbols and sacred geometry for the sake of channeling the spirits of the world. In addition to the various spirits discussed in channeling, we should also take a look at the ancient Shinto gods. The origin story of Shinto explains that the world, specifically Japan, was created by both a matriarch and a patriarch. Izunami and Izunagi together served a function akin to Zeus, or Odin, overseeing the Shinto pantheon and in many cases giving birth to the gods. Anyone familiar with Amaterasu, the sun goddess, and her bumbling angry brother Susanoo might know that Izunami and Izunagi were their parents and the progenitors of the Shinto gods. What some may not know is that their first child was named Hiruko, which means something like leech child. Given that Hiruko was lacking in limbs and was severely crippled from birth, what may further surprise viewers is how, in Japan, the absorption of Shinto iconography into mainstream secular culture has made many of these individuals symbols rather than characters. Moving on, we were surprised to learn that petroglyphs, that is, rock carvings, often ancient in nature, exist in Japan. This likely won't surprise anyone familiar with archaeology or ancient human history, as petroglyphs have been uncovered all over the world. It comes as a shock to us, however, as in all of our research into Jomon culture, that is, prehistoric Japanese culture, we never read anything about petroglyphs. Though not super common around Japan, several caves within the country contain notable examples of rock carvings. The two primary sites are Fugope Cave and Tamiya Cave, both of which are open to the public as historic sites, though five total caves are listed by other sources. Suffice to say, these caves have definitely been added to our travel itinerary. Um, I definitely wrote the script back in like 2019, so um, things were a little different then, but Eventually, we will get to our travel itinerary. Everyone, uh, stay safe. Scientists and linguists have spent more than 100 years now studying Japan's petroglyphs, searching for their origins and meanings since their first discovery. Unfortunately, as of yet, most of these petroglyphs remain largely obscure. This could be thanks to their complete enigmatic nature, or due to their small sample size. Tons of Paleolithic pottery and art has been uncovered in Japan from the Jomon people, who were mentioned earlier. However, not much prehistoric art has been found, whether rock carvings or cave paintings, with these five or so sites being the only ones yet discovered, thanks to their irregular nature and seeming similarities with petroglyphs found elsewhere. Japan's few petroglyphs have garnered some… interesting theories. Some far-out there theories claim that they're the result of aliens, Japan being visited by the Sumerians or the Akkadians, maybe even the Atlanteans. Dive deep enough and it gets kind of weird. Speaking of which, look up the Yonaguni Monument. We can't think of another time this might come up on the show, so let's shoehorn it in here. Speaking of aliens, let's talk about aliens. Believe it or not, UFOs are pretty darn popular in Japan. Japan has one of the only observatories that scans the visual spectrum of space, not just radio frequencies as many other observatories do. 
Miyuki Hatoyama, the wife of former Prime Minister Yukio Hatoyama, penned a book titled Very Strange Things I've Encountered, where she openly described being abducted as a young woman and traveling to Venus. This book was published about a year prior to her husband becoming Prime Minister, and was a big talking point at the time. Oh, and Miyuki Hatoyama also mentioned at one point an experience meeting Tom Cruise in a prior incarnation, where he was, naturally, a Japanese man. Aliens run deep in the Japanese government and classical art as well. In 2007, contemporary Chief Cabinet Secretary Nobutaka Machimura publicly stated that he personally believes in the existence of aliens and UFOs, or UFOs. Again, this was while he was serving in the cabinet. That same year, Defense Minister Shigeru Ishiba explained that there was no reason to deny the existence of UFOs manned by extraterrestrials. Let me repeat that. The Defense Minister. Going a bit further back, we have the appearance of the Utsurobune, or hollow ship. This mysterious ship washed ashore in Japan in 1803, during Japan's military-run period of isolationism. At the time, most of Japan's outside contact was with competing Dutch or Portuguese traders, or with Portuguese Jesuit missionaries. Bear that in mind when you consider that when the Otsurobune came to Japan, the story goes, a woman who spoke no Japanese and looked foreign arrived completely alone. Artistic depictions of the ship, however, commonly display her as an alien rather than a foreigner. This one seems a little suspicious if you ask us, given that it had been about 200 years since most Japanese citizens would have seen a non-Japanese person. It's still interesting nonetheless. More recently, in 1986, Japan Airlines Flight 1627 witnessed either two or three objects flying alongside them between Reykjavik and Anchorage. This incident is well reported to the point that YouTubers have even created video recreations in Flight Sim 2004. What we mean to get at with all of this is that the UFO fever is a thing in Japan as much as it is and has remained in the United States. It's likely not going anywhere anytime soon, and it only makes sense that aliens would creep into all manner of Japanese narratives. And all of this is to say nothing of the classic bamboo cutter's tale, a fable concerning a poor bamboo cutter and his wife who adopt a small girl from a bamboo stalk, only to discover she's an alien. Lastly, and again without spoilers, let's actually return to the film at hand and take a look at the style of the subject. Within the film, we can begin to see a couple of through lines for Shiere Ishii's found footage projects. Most notable of these is the director's presence. First, we have the television presenter in Naroi, Shiraishi himself in a cult, and later a film director working with a group of up-and-coming actors in cult, which we'll get to someday soon. Shiraishi here consistently breaks the fourth wall in a gambit which forces the viewer to either completely accept or completely reject the project. Most found footage movies rely entirely on the look and feel of the film, but mainly being interested in immersing us rather than challenging us. Shiraishi's inclusion of the director, in this case himself, as well as some other celebrities that you may recognize, who are more than likely just friends of Shiraishi's, is a risky gambit that pays off here. It might not as much in cult, though for different reasons there, which again, we'll get to later on. Shiraishi also shows an interest in the authenticity of the technology he uses, which is more common with found footage at large. Shiraishi, however, should certainly be commended for his dedication here. In Occult, the stabbing incident is recorded by one individual in 2005, and is thus shot in a 4x3 aspect ratio. Shiraishi, on the other hand, is using a documentary camera, meaning that his segments are shot in 16x9. Both sides are juxtaposed, again heightening our immersion and forcing us to accept the film as more real. For quality aside, Shiraishi also goes about intentionally obscuring some visuals. This makes us more alert for weird moments, having us question if we just caught something out of the corner of our eye, or if we're just seeing things. In a way, it seems to draw a connection between us and Eno, the man seeing miracles throughout the film. To an extent, a cult makes us feel like we're giving into a conspiratorial mindset as we lean into the screen and try to make out a blurry, digitally artifacted image. Overall, Occult is another worthwhile look into the mind of the preeminent found footage director of Japan. Other individual examples of the genre can claim their place alongside Naroi, and admittedly Occult may not quite be on that level. But Shiraishi as an artist proves himself to be a winner time and again. Occult is a notable work for the director, having some big shoes to fill and doing a good job of attempting to. 
It's a strange mishmash of different elements which doesn't always work, especially towards the end unfortunately. But Occult is absolutely worth a look for fans of Shira Ishii and found footage as a whole. It might sound like we're talking down about it, but honestly, be sure to check this one out and let us know what you think about Occult in the comments below, as well as your favorite film from Koji Shiraishi. The man has a ton of other movies to explore, and we'll be delving into more of them shortly here on Cinema Nippon, so be sure to stay tuned.